Hello, everybody, and welcome again to another one of my uh, podcasts. If you're listening on um, wherever you're listening on Spotify, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, hello. If you're watching on YouTube, um, hello. Delighted to be joined today by um, Christina and uh, Eric. Hello, Christina. Hi, hi. Thanks for having us. Hello, Eric. Hello. Thank you for having us. My absolute pleasure. Now, um, we have Stop the Sales Drop, which is uh, both of yours uh, mantra. And the focus around today's uh, discussion is going to be account-based marketing. And um, I think I know what account-based marketing is, but I do believe, a bit like social selling, that over the years, it's kind of lost what its true sense is. I know that both of you, in terms of your business, you're very much about getting the focus back on what this actually means and how sales teams, marketing teams, can truly benefit from account-based marketing when deployed properly. <laughs> like anything in life, when it's done properly, uh, there is huge success uh, behind it. So uh, without further ado, um, I'll let you decide who's going to uh, go first in maybe giving a bit of background on both of you, and then we can dive into unpacking what account-based marketing is and then go from, uh, from there. So you know what, I'm gonna pick. Eric, you go first. <laughs> who are you? What's your background? And what's Stop the Sales Drop all about? Sure. I'm the CEO of both Stop the Sales Drop and Personal ABM. Stop the Sales Drop is our educational arm, our event arm of the business, Personal ABM, which is about taking a one-on-one -on -one account based marketing approach to win touch and expand specific accounts that clients want to win so that is our execution so mm -hmm. now we have the execution and the education part of the aspect so that's where both play <clears throat> we created stop the sales drop because personal abm is focused solely on revenue versus leads versus right. awareness we want to as we said win those accounts or we want to expand, we want margin growth. And as clients saw our pauses in their business, um, they scaled back in their marketing, mm -hmm. which means we needed to make a shift in our own business. Yeah. Didn't want to have any impacts to us. Yeah. Uh, wanted to, and that's where we came in play is like, want to build relationships with people like yourself. Yep. Those that we brought into the training, mm -hmm. uh, we want to build relations with people that are listening to the trainings and our events and our virtual summits. So that's where it was about building those relationships. So then we can come out even stronger than when we uh, were before yeah. the C19. So that's where Stop the Sales Shop came in because it's, there's always going to be internal. There's always going to be external factors that lead to sales plateaus, sales drops, and sales mm -hmm. drops. Yeah. And it's those times that we need to make shifts. And one of those shifts is how we connect with our target audience. How do we connect with those prospects, make a more personal connection versus taking this volume numbers game where there is no relevance. And that's what personal ABM is about. Perfect. Christina, so your background, how do you fit into uh, to all of this with, uh, uh, with Eric and both of your vision of where you want to, uh, to go in terms of helping um, sales stop the drop, as it were? Um, well, I'm the president of both Personal ABM and mm -hmm. uh, Stop the Sales Drop. I play more of a um, operational imp implementation role. So yeah. I'm working with the, our clients to, Eric is more of the strategy and content person, and then I actually implement it on different platforms um, and we work, we've been working together over 10 years now. Okay. Um, so strictly B2B and, and techs um, software, so SaaS type of things and yeah. some professional service firms, but more on the technology side and then with logistics companies and the, any tech that they might offer as well. But it's more about, um, hence the name personal ABM, taking the account-based marketing approach and then putting more of a um, but personal relevance and almost like a mic put every other account under a microscope. So mm -hmm. every particular target or account is different and um, it's not just a mass approach. 
<laughs> not just a mass approach. And we're seeing a lot of that online at the moment. <laughs> so um, the fact that you, you know, this, this, your, your business personal ABM has been going for 10 years or so would suggest that this concept of account-based marketing is nothing new uh, in the world of, of sales and marketing. So uh, let's break it down. How, how, do you, how do you describe or how do you see what account-based marketing is? Because I see a lot of talk around what people think it is and isn't a bit like social selling digital selling modern selling we were saying before we came uh, came live i saw on twitter the other day apparently there's now account-based engagement <laughs> which when i delved into it, i said i'm pretty sure that's account-based marketing just with a different term to it but okay if that's what you want to call it go for it so um christina i'll let you lead on that what's your take on uh, on what abm really is um, well, we what we have seen ABM being is more of um, speaking at industries and speaking at actual um, groups of companies versus yeah. our approach, taking that personal account based approach, you create your LinkedIn profile or any kind of profile that you have on different platforms, your content and messaging to speak those specific accounts. Um, and the sp more importantly, the specific human buyers within those accounts. So you want specific prospects to see your um, interaction with them, whether it's your profile, whether it's invite to connect, any kind of nurture in mail um, and show them that you understand them and what they're thinking, what they're going through, mm -hmm. um, why they're going through it at this time, you know, depending on what's going on in their market, in their internal company internally, um, and that you have a solution for them. So you want them to be, or you want to be viewed um, as a partner, not necessarily, um, you know, a salesperson or um, just someone who's just trying to pitch them. So we wanna make sure that everything that we look or send to a, a prospect or a target, it, it doesn't read like a template. It doesn't read like it wasn't personalized at all. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's where we're coming in from. So personal ABM is rather than be a campaign, it focuses on the interactions you have with specific key decision makers okay. and influencers within targeted accounts. You want to win, protect, and expand. The three types of ABM mm -hmm. is one to many. Yeah. This is where sales and marketing speaks at industries. They have 500 plus accounts. Um, these are the accounts that also bring you probably the smallest margins because I do not have any relevance beyond industry relevance. From speaking to hundreds of accounts, I'm not going to get relevant with them. So those that respond are already looking for a solution. They have a predefined vision, which means they are going to look for the most capabilities, the most features that meets their needs at the lowest price. Mm -hmm. You have a one in four chance, or maybe even less, uh, of winning here and, and margins are this much smaller. Yeah. You then have one to few. Here you start to get some relevance. You get company relevance, but this is where sales and marketing, they speak at accounts. They, what they forget to do is that um, every person within an account has a different value that they want. Mm -hmm. What's valuable to Christina is it's gonna be different to me. A gap is going to impact me differently than Christina. We both have different roles. We both have different focuses. But yet, when we take a one to few approach, we're still speaking to all the buying centers in the same way. So we're not speaking to people. Mm -hmm. We're speaking at accounts. Personal ABM is where we're focusing on the people within those accounts that we want. So we're speaking to them. Messages are written for them versus reading like you just took some information off my profile and pasted it into a template. And it, you could just know if I took away that personalization, yeah. that it's being sent to thousands of others. Yet speaking at an account, at speaking at companies in the industries and not to people. We have to make where we come and we're resonating with that person where profiles are speaking to accounts and the people we want on LinkedIn, our messaging, our emails, our content, even our live sign conversations. Mm -hmm. We have to speak to the people and get personal relevance 
versus making it seem like it's a numbers game. And that's what it's about. So that's, that's an interest. And again, I find this, if I kind of, and this is the weird thing for me. So I've been in sales for the best part of 20 years, came from recruitment, the, recruit, the recruitment world, where it's just me. I own the deal, cradle to grave, smash the phones out, 100 cold calls, because that's all I could do. You get the meeting, you go for the pitch, you pitch, you create your own pitch document, you then sell, and then you deliver in terms of finding the, the candidate. But we were trained to do exactly what you've just described in terms of this has to be the kind of that, that one-to-one -one conversation, because when you get that 30 second, that 30 second call or that 30 second kind of elevator pitch, that's what you then have to do. And as I then started to scale on the accounts that I then had to manage, I was like drilled it into the teams that were looking after them. Look, this is how this account wants to be looked after. These are the people, people you need to be um, talking to. This is how they want to be talking to. This is when they want to be talked to. If it's not recorded in CRM, we're going to have a big problem because I need to see what's going on. And if you deviate from this, we're going to have a big, even, even bigger problem. And that's what the business did. And it, you know, we were very successful within our, um, within our team. And I guess what I'm hearing is, and this is kind of what I want to come on to say, is that what you're saying is current sales and marketing across you know social email is just not personal it's just the the blanket spray and pray tick box done and i and i believe and i was discussing this earlier today actually i believe that it was actually a linkedin sales solutions um live demo and they're talking about kpis and kpis need to be aligned to the customer and the customer outcome not the sales outcome, which is very short term, typically month or quarter, driven by share, trying to drive shareholder value or dividends or what have you, which just loses focus in terms of what I'm trying to achieve. So for me, what you're describing is not actually anything new, but I, that's, I mean, that's a big shift in mindset, right? That's a big shift in mindset for the salespeople and the marketing teams, but also further up the food chain in terms of uh, the types of reporting that is currently generated uh, through sales ops, sales enablement, what have you, to keep management, and for those who are listening, I'm doing inverted commas, uh, happy. Yes, it is, because we're all focused on leads, we're focused on awareness, but it's got to become where marketing even becomes accountable for revenue. Okay. Marketing and sales needs to work together. Marketing needs to work with accounts where we can expand. We can protect those accounts. We have to be able to work from leadership down. We need to follow a buying vision, make sure that our communications, and we're showing where our unique value is because most differentiation is focused on features. We're not focusing mm -hmm. on how we're uniquely filling a gap within that prospect's account. So it is a top to bottom approach that is all focused on revenue objectives, meeting and al aligning with the customers, as you mentioned, so we could drive stronger growth. It's not wrong, and it shouldn't be about leads. If the leads aren't going anywhere, and most leads just get stuck, what good is it? Yeah. And we need to be able to have a better interaction, a better experience. And we can't have this experience if we're not relatable. And we're not going to be relatable unless we start driving that relevance in all communications, in all channels. So let's start to break this down a bit, because at the moment we're kind of talking quite high level theory, what needs to happen. How, and I've looked, on the, I've looked on your website. I mean, you, you're working with some big brands. There are some big blue chip brands that you have on your, um, uh, your client roster. Um, so some big beasts that need to be shifted in terms of you know, process, thoughts, et cetera. So how do you, how do you actually, I'm not asking this really, really badly, where do you start? How do you start this conversation internally with an organization going, look, what you're currently doing isn't working. There's a better, more effective way of doing it. This is kind of the roadmap, all the sort of things that you need to to think about and, and consider. So Christina, let you take that one. Yeah, I think maybe the, the, the term account-based marketing is a little deceiving. People think that it's only for marketing, but it should be account-based marketing and account-based sales. Mm -hmm. um, it is an, it's in a, a cultural shift that everyone needs to make and everyone's, uh, a lot of companies like to say that they're customer-centric. And I think when they mean customer-centric that they mean they are focusing on their customer's success 
but they don't use, they don't switch their marketing or their mm -hmm. any kind of content they're putting out to be focused on the actual customer. I, I, I see that misalignment there. I don't see how you can say that you're customer centric and then everything you talk about is your company yeah. and what you offer and not how it's actually helping and showing results. Um, the customer has to be first in all kinds of conversations because at the end of the day, they're the ones that are driving the revenue. So it is. And I think what I, what I find almost depressingly hilarious at the moment is that all these big firms are coming out again, big advisory firms going, Hey, COVID-19 has said that we need to be more customer centric, you know, customer centric. We need to put ourselves in our client's shoes more. Hey, let them like, what? Seriously? We've been talking about this for like so long. Years. We're still talking about it. And it comes, you know, again, I, you know, I know that I do a lot of work in the professional service space and, uh, you know, on Twitter, there are a lot of general counsel saying, if I get one more email from a law firm about force majeure and what that means for, you know, contracts being broken because of COVID, I'm, you know, literally going to lose it. I just want them to pick up the phone to me and see how I'm doing at a human level. You know, that's in, yeah. putting yourself in your, in your customer's shoes. But before we dive, let's not digress there. So this is about, okay putting yourself in your customer's shoes. Let's, let's look at that then. How do, you, how do you help sales teams, marketing teams genuinely do that rather than just pay, you know, to your point, lip service, lip service to it in terms of um, what you're doing? Um, with our clients, with our sales and marketing, we teach them to focus on account-specific gaps and where the personal impacts are. But okay. we do this... And it even goes back to your first question. How do we get everyone on board? We even do this not only for our clients' sales and marketing, mm -hmm. but we do this with our own clients and show them where their gaps are, where their impacts. And just for example, we start to look at where the profiles, their website communications, their social communications, and show them where they're not relevant. Mm -hmm. Now... Um, there was a LinkedIn sales study um, report in 20, uh, earlier this year after C19, and they reported that 44% of organizations are seeing significant drops in responsiveness. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we know that buyers are still wanting to engage with um, new, with experts that can help them with their current challenges and future challenges. So I don't think, and Christina didn't think that it really was anything to do with C19, with the responsiveness. Mm -hmm. It's the fact that everyone's now going from traditional to digital. We're trying to expand our network so much. Mm -hmm. We're pushing out messaging. We're pushing out invites. There's no relevance there. So we even started doing a study on profiles, on messaging, and I think, Christine, we, what we were, you, were, you and the team were reviewing, I think, like 100 to 200 LinkedIn profiles a day. And we figured we would see over time that they would change. People would try to be more aligned with their buyers, but the trend didn't change. And we found that 95 to 99% was evolving. Christine, you want to talk a little bit about that? <laughs> that was funny. your study. <laughs> This is very funny that you bring this up only because the results were um, kind of sad. <laughs> um, the study that Eric's talking about was LinkedIn's 2020 state of the sales report. And that's the, the that he's referencing. Um, a lot of people were not talking uh, consistency is things that we, we saw are across the board. They weren't telling a relevant business story for prospects. So they weren't um, taking them through that the whole buyer's journey that Eric had alluded to, um, making that emotional human human connection. Um, and because people are social distancing, and it looks like we're going to be continuing for who knows how long, um, connection, that human to human connection is uh, more important now than ever. And it's just going to get worse and worse. So people actually have to make a human connection and, and speak directly to these accounts that they want or anyone they're trying to either maybe get funding for if they're looking for investors. Mm -hmm. um, so they're not tailoring their messaging or tailoring their profile or whatever kind of content they're putting out. However, it's, you know, packaged in a case study yeah. article, whatever. Um, they're not teaching for differentiation and showing unique value. So why are you different? And not just, again, like Eric said, not just saying, well, we have X, Y, and Z um, 
features that our competitors don't. Um, they need to see how you're going to fill a gap that they necessarily have. Prospects need to see this mm -hmm. and the personal impacts that you're going to have to them on, in their role, whether it's their department, but more importantly, their individual role. Um, and most, most of the time what we saw for that, looking at profiles and what people are just kind of doing, and this was, we looked at sales and marketing people mostly, um, mm -hmm. just to give a reference, um, no customer stories throughout the any kind of content to support the claims that they're making. Um, so there are a lot of these blanket claims that we have X, Y, Z percent of increase, but I have to take your word for it because yeah. I don't see any examples. No social proof. Exactly. Social proof is it's, Oh, but it's on our website. But if I have to go looking for it, then it, I, do the homework for me type of thing. Um, another thing that we saw that it was, I'm sure you've, you've seen this as well is a lot of, profiles or resumes as opposed to building trust with the prospects or your customers or whoever it is you're trying to engage with. Because if I see a list of your previous employers, the roles and your accomplishments, sales quotas you've hit, your, um, you know, awards you've won, I automatically have my defenses come up and I say, okay, I'm going to connect with this person or I'm going to engage with this person. And they're going to try to pitch me or set me up on a demo call within five seconds. So, those kind of things are good if you're those kind of um you know awards and achievements are awesome if you're mm -hmm. selling sales training yeah because that's what you know somebody who's looking for that is going to want but if you're trying to sell to an actual individual um your services and solutions you need to see that um you can build trust and and i think mentioning those quotas and things like that kind of um deteriorates the trust a little bit. And then another thing we saw was people are also writing in the third person, which I'm not sure why that's happening. Because well, I, I don't why, engage I know with why, you. And I tell you exactly why that's happening. And that's because, well, in my world, people copy and paste their CVs and professional services. And CVs are written in the third person. Outside of that, um, that's because they pay people to write their LinkedIn profile for them. Yep. And then that person yep. writes that, per that profile in the third person. And every time I talk to, every time I, um, I, you know, I work with people in terms of, I go, read your LinkedIn profile out aloud. Read it aloud. <laughs> I make them do it. And, they, and then they go, oh, yeah. right. Yep. I, I, Light I bulb. <laughs> would they Why, you wouldn't talk in the third person at a networking event? <laughs> <laughs> would, what they forget is that, and LinkedIn's study also showed this, that 62% of decision makers look for an informative LinkedIn profile when considering connecting to or talking with business leadership or sales. So I need to see my relevance, mm -hmm. which means I want to see myself in your, I need to see the stories that are going to be related to me. I need to see that you understand a lot of people, if they do not talk about their resume and they use it more of a sales and marketing tool, they design the profile. I want accounts like Oracle which means I'm going to miss really those gaps, those impacts. I'm going to miss that personal relevance because I just made it too general now of saying I want accounts like Oracle, like Microsoft, yeah. like this or like this. And I didn't get that specific. But once I get specific and I'm really looking data and what is happening within the company, now what can be happening with those employees? I can now start to shape a profile Mm -hmm. that will speak to Oracle as well as others that are similar to them. But I'm going to have much greater personal relevance because now I'm speaking to them. Here's gaps. Here's stories that were designed for you. How do you, I, mean, that, but it, it, I want to pick up on this kind of helping the sales and the marketing teams kind of spot the gaps, as it were, in terms of where their product service solution can can fill the gap per, you know, per, uh, per se, because that, that's, we're moving into sales training, right? We're actually moving into ex explaining to people how to sell. So how do you, and also you then got the detention, dare I say, and I'm now just focusing on, uh, on sales people, not marketing. You've got sales leaders go, but I, I need the numbers. I need the numbers in terms of, I've got to hit my numbers, not financial, but you know, K, you know KPIs, metrics in terms of call rates, email, outbound, out, whatever it is. How are you? How are you dealing with with that in terms of you may be working with sales teams that don't even understand the basics of what needs to be done to spot the gap, 
and then the tension that is, uh, and this is actually my in the previous uh, my previous guest, another Christina, around spending more time to personalise outreach. You do less for more. How how do you manage sales? You know, sales managers or sales directors would go, yeah, yeah, but I don't want my, I don't want my sales reps wasting their time on LinkedIn doing their research. Perfectly. I just want them doing the KPIs. That's why they hire us to do the execution on LinkedIn, <laughs> but. With the ones that we work with, they want revenue objectives. They know that they need to make change. So they are going away from, moving away from these activity yeah. because activity isn't leading to anything different. Yeah. They want that revenue growth. They want a new approach. Those are the companies that we start to work with. Mm -hmm. And we work with marketing and leadership first. We also start to work with sales and account teams to learn the stories. Yeah. I'm really point, trying to pull in and see, all right, you say you did this. And if you look at any case study, it's a little bit about the company. Um, here's the challenge. Mm -hmm. Here's the solution. We did this all about activities, no stories. It doesn't really talk about any of the gaps. That's where we start to come in. It's like, all right, now let's look at your existing clients. Got you. Let's see those, now let's pull out the information. We talk to accounts, we talk to the teams, but we go into what didn't they consider? Where were the gaps before? Mm -hmm. What were those personal impacts? And they would try to get very general and we go and we push them to get very specific. Mm -hmm. Or even go back to the clients. Where are those impacts at the company? Not just, oh, it improved productivity. Well, what did it do to the customer? What was that customer experience? How did that change? How did operation change? Mm -hmm. Why? We try to get behind the why yeah. versus just talking about how. Well, yeah. what we did, because in most times, technologies are very similar. Yeah. Uh, marketing services, there's tons of people doing account-based marketing. There's tons of people doing lead gen. So it's not what you did that is really yeah. differentiator. It's how you did, or well, not even more how, it's why. What is that approach that did, did differently? What did you feel that, you, that others couldn't do and why? It is that why that is the most important part. And that's what we try to get in. Then we go in and say, okay, now you... What are the accounts? And that's why we talk about winning, protecting, and expanding. What mm -hmm. are those accounts that are in status quo? What are the ones that are at risk? They didn't see the real full value. So where are their gaps? Where are their impacts? And what stories should we be telling? Who should we be talking to? We like working with existing accounts first because they were your existing, they were your initial customers. They were your initial prospects. Yeah but no one knows how to engage with them. Everyone engages them at the manager level. Yeah. Uh, customer success teams, it's, I talk to these managers, but they don't know how to talk to the VPs. Mm -hmm. Sales and marketing isn't giving them the support. They're relying on accounts to try to retain them. And then we wonder why we have churn. Yeah. So that's where we go. Or which ones could we have more stronger growth if they see your full value? Well, what is, then we look into what is the customer seeing what do you think they're getting? Where's those gaps there? What aren't they seeing? What aren't they considering? Those are the, stories, the stories we start telling. I From think there, now we look at, exist, at new accounts. What matches these stories? Which are your best accounts yeah. that we should be targeting now that we have these stories? Now that we know the gaps, now that we have the impacts and we see it working with existing customers, who, where should we go next? That's where we focus on. You, you raise some such such valid points there, and I think it, where, where the where the, the rubber meets the road, as it were, is the is the why, and then the how. And you're so right. Whenever you read a case study, it's just a list of this is what we did. And I remember back in my um, my consulting days, a long time ago, when I was a marketing BD function for a consulting firm, there was a partner who used to behave like a belligerent five year old whenever we were doing pitch rehearsals and his colleagues would stand up and make some, you know, big grandiose statement. He'd usually be leaning back, feet on the desk, and he goes, so what? And they get really angry with him. And he was like, so what? And they go, the client would never say, so what? It's like, yeah, the client's thinking, so what? And if you cannot articulate what the so what is in that statement, 
how the hell is somebody who you're pitching to going to be able to articulate the so what if you can't? And sometimes they would have like, oh my God, we're going to have a fist fight here in this meeting room. But he was doing it to actually drill down. If you cannot articulate the so what in any statement that you are saying, do not say it. And you're so right, Eric. There's so you know, much kind of, this is what we did. And how is, the, how is that going to help me in terms of the what i am having to yep uh, to to, uh, to deal with yeah case studies talk about how we what we did profiles talk about what we do here's a profile for someone that we're actually going to be giving a profile makeover in the next couple of weeks from linkedin to digital strategies i am frequently asked to educate business owners and professionals through workshops webinars and presentations i'm equally comfortable on stage or working one-to-one -one. i have trained thousands of people to use linkedin to achieve their professional and business goals i'm at my best when i'm helping c-level executives business owners entrepreneurs notice i've all crossed the gamut yeah. i'm not talking to anyone yet uh understand how to leverage the many facets of the internet to support the business objectives many still i don't see any areas of expertise it's all over the place my ideal clients are those. <laughs> Everyone. My ideal clients are those who know they need to increase online visibility, but struggle with how to do it. And again, if I know something, I'm looking. I'm yeah. comparing. It's becoming a price game. Uh, who I serve? I help business owners and professionals to increase exposure, develop relationships, and generate more business leads. Claims that everyone makes. Yeah. How I do it differently. Internet marketing has grown complicated and can be overwhelming. By working to understand your business and goals, I help simplify online marketing in a way anyone can understand. How many times do people say they simplify internet marketing? And internet marketing is not even a thing anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> I have over 30 years in corporate leadership role and business ownership using technology to build and develop award-winning solutions and results. If all you need is a website, there are plenty of people that can help. If you are a trusted advisor who can identify the online strategies and solutions that will drive your business results, that's where I can help. Again, by do yeah. how are you gonna help? Why? I, what I, is your I just heard difference? fluff. Indeed. Um, Christina, can you give some examples, um, let's eat our own dog food here, or rather your own dog food, um, of where you've taken company and it's, you may mention the company name but by working with them executing your uh, your strategy and your approach with that organization you took them from a to b christina a to b as in this this is this is the problem that you mm. brought in to fix so revenue growth more personal etc cetera, etc cetera. are you able to don't, as i don't need to give me company names i appreciate that in terms of that side of things but you know this sector this industry if you can say company name awesome and yep. By, by working with us as, as experts, they were here and we got them to there over a 12, 18 month, three year, you know, three year engagement. Yeah, absolutely, that. absolutely. We worked with um, uh, logistics and 3PL company called Schneider National, they're big in the US, mm -hmm. um, out of Green Bay, Wisconsin. And we worked with one of their departments um, we, actually, we typically work with VP of sales. That's why the, the stuff that Eric was talking about when we talk, um, talk with the sales, leader about the customer stories, they're the ones that are going to have the best mm -hmm. customer stories because they're going to know more detail and they're going to be able to answer more detail or go back to the, the client. So we were engaging with the VP of sales in one of the departments and we changed her entire approach on LinkedIn and her approach to the LinkedIn publishing platform. So the content she was sharing, articles that she was sharing on uh, industry relevant publications to all talk about this um, the gaps that, that her clients were seeing in mm -hmm. their particular um, logistics uh, plans and where Schneider was filling those gaps and how it was uniquely different because 3PLs, at least in the States, are very competitive, Right. Um, but they're all talking about the same things. They're very mm -hmm. old school in terms of sales. Again, features, benefits, um, and it was making everything um, a numbers game, so they were competing based uh they were going to rfp right away they weren't even yeah. um RFP and price. Mm -hmm. yeah yep. so we changed the conversation to talk about actual value and they um one client was was it png eric no it was sigma but it was 
Well, I wanted to say that, and before we go into any results and what we did differently, Snyder, before we came, they were starting to use what we call the challenger sale. Yeah. You read the challenger book. Yeah. It's one of our favorite sales processes mm -hmm. because we're we like to focus on reframing prospects' thoughts and ideas. But it was only in their live conversations. Social and email didn't teach for differentiation. Yeah. Profiles didn't give that reframe. That's where I'm also not talking, when I talk about prospects, thoughts, and ideas, when I'm speaking to accounts, and I talk to account-specific gaps and impacts, we're also trying to think of what is that prospect thinking? What's in their mind? Mm -hmm. Why are they doing something? Why, what actions are they taking and why? So that we could reframe them within the profile before they even speak to us. So that's where it's about, it's changing their thoughts and that's what people are missing when it comes to social. Yeah. I'm, I'm pushing in my agenda of what I do. So I give a value selling proposition, but I'm not speaking to the accounts. I'm not entering their world. I am just pushing my agenda versus understanding them, showing them I understand them, but giving them what they haven't thought about. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're doing. That's what we started to do with profiles, with speaking to the accounts, with Schneider Logistics, they're the trucking company, but they also sold transportation management solutions. Mm -hmm. They were hitting the mid-market. Um, could you have enterprise with enterprise solutions? And yeah, yeah. everyone is the larger companies, uh, Ryder, uh, all the big companies, they give all the attention to the ones that are going to give them the most revenue. So yeah. yeah, they're getting the best transportation management solutions, the most attention, the best technology. You have uh, solutions for the lower end, mm -hmm. but the mid-market is where they like stuck in that middle. It's like that middle child. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's where we started coming in and talking about the gaps. We started talking about impacts. And what happened is Sigma, mid-market company that's actually part of a large enterprise, Cisco, yeah. they were unresponsive to sales and marketing for five years. They were getting the general messaging. Profiles were general. They didn't, the VP of supply chain at Sigma did not see that personal relevance. But when you shifted that conversation, mm -hmm. it went from five years of unresponsiveness to connecting, to joining the LinkedIn community, mm -hmm. to taking a survey, to having a phone conversation and having a three month sales cycle versus an 18 month sales cycle yeah. and became a $2 million win. It was like, um, they keep clients for eight years mm -hmm. is their normal retention. And it was like a 750, no, like a, um, a seventy five thousand dollars a year contract or something yeah, like that. But it was yeah. led to two to five million dollars yeah. over that time period with someone that was unresponsive for five years. Yeah. That's a big difference there. But it's because the personal relevance. I'm not just speaking at accounts, I'm not speaking at industries. Mm -hmm. Indeed. And so was that, was that Schneider selling to Sigma or was that another example in terms of, um, yeah, that was, Schneider, that was because he was talking about Schneider selling to Sigma. Yeah. Um, but they were trying for five years. I think it was right, Chris. Yeah. Through they were trying to get in and then I was, I was confusing stories. Uh, there was a PNG that they protected them when they went to RFP to compete with another company and they, and yeah. they protected that risk account. I got confused, but yes, they, Schneider was selling into Sigma yeah. and they were just getting, Nowhere. Nowhere. They weren't hitting any any kind of yeah. dead end. So And it was all and, and this is and this and this is the thing, it's so easy. It's so easy, isn't it? That's the thing. We all get swayed by, you know, technology and the technology stacks. And there's actually the 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 LinkedIn live session this morning was the European sales report, the twenty twenty sales report, state of sales. And again, they're touching on there around we just too much technology, let's strip it down, let's look at our processes, let's look at what's what, and it's not actually difficult. And there were, I think it was a high percentage in terms of north of 60% was quoted around actually one of the most powerful things is a brand to brand referral and how you can then start to leverage your network to, um, uh, to, uh, to do that. So 
if we're going to kind of summarize, so personal ABM is your big kind of one to many spray and pray type of sort of thing. Your approach and your, but I'm actually totally on board with what you, you say around the whole per, the personal ABM side of things. That's taking kind of the ABM concepts, but drilling it down to that uh, that kind of one to one one to one approach. So, Christina, I'm going to put you on the spot. What would be the top three things, or top how many things? That's always three, isn't it? Top how many it's points three. that um, either a you know a, a rep, a VP, head of marketing, CEO. I mean, let's, let's go to the top. What would they need to uh, think about to start kind of shifting the uh, the needle, as it were? Uh, I think the first thing it would be is every message that you send, whether it's email, voicemail, however you're, you're communicating has to be personally relevant mm -hmm. as much as you can do without sounding too, I guess, creepy, but yeah. <laughs> so yeah. every, every message that you send to a prospect has to have intention. There has to be yeah. a reason that you're sending it. You're not just mm -hmm. checking in to see how things are. Yeah. Um, uh, another thing I would think is just take a look at your online presence. It doesn't have to necessarily be LinkedIn, whatever networking platform yeah. you're using, whatever you're using to sell digitally. Are you talking about yourself mm -hmm. or are you talking about your actual targets that you want to engage yeah. with and you understand what they're talking about or understand what they're going through, especially now in this current market or however this market stays. Mm -hmm. um, and then lastly, I would just think um, to before you hit send on anything, read it to yourself like you were saying, make sure it doesn't sound too templated. Yeah. It doesn't sound like you're talking into a vacuum or um, just read it out loud to yourself. And if you were going to get that from someone, would you delete it or would you actually engage with yeah. it? Well, it's a good thing. Would you respond to what you're just sending? If the answer is no, <laughs> don't send it. Um, <laughs> yep. well, we have to go beyond just hitting pain points because yeah. I'm starting to sound like everyone else. Pain points... I mean, it's just, everyone is responding to those. Yeah. But what we're not really focusing on is the business problem. Yeah. Why are they having those pain points? What is actually going on within that company? What is the technical problem? And then, then what are those impacts at the company level? Yeah. The rank, the division, um, the personal level. We're all having different gaps, uh, impacts. As I said before, an impact to Christina is going to be a different impact to me. Yeah. So where are those personal impacts? And then the customer, how are we impacting the customer because of these gaps that we might not have thought about and how we need to adjust. That's where we need to go is focusing on those business problems, really understanding, mm -hmm. see what is happening or we'll go beyond data. There's a bunch of data. Bombour, yeah. all the other third party data. We talked a little bit about this when you yeah. and I did a masterclass. There's so much yeah. data out there, but no, we're not creating that story to make it personal relevant. We're not figuring out a way to use that data. Mm -hmm. It's just like, it's just data. Yeah. But why do they sign up for my webinar? What is now happening within that company that they could be? I'm not searching for the why. I'm not searching for the story so I can give them an unconsidered gap. I'm not giving them an unconsidered problem. I'm not teaching them something new based on their situation. And it is their situation, their specific situation. That's what personal ABM is about. We're entering your account world. We're entering your prospect. What are they feeling? That's what it's all about. So that's where we're coming in with that one-on-one. So what is their problem? Where is their impact versus what is their pain point? Perfect. Keenan oh. uh, was just talking about this on his LinkedIn. He did a LinkedIn Live recently. Um, that's another book. If you like Challenger Sale, it's his yeah. book is called Gap Selling. And yeah, no, that's what we're all about is selling those gaps because that's where the differentiated conversation is. Everyone focuses on pain points. We have to go beyond. We have to go beyond. We have to go beyond. What a what a nice place to uh, to wrap this uh, wrap this up. So, where can people find you? Definitely um, connect with me on LinkedIn. That's well, where I, I I live there. Just in case I you hadn't link realized your that. Profile in this uh, in this. I'm doing this YouTube thing now. I never know where. It was. Somewhere. <laughs> Wherever it is, somewhere. underneath I'll side to, somewhere. Uh, to uh, to Christina, Eric. Where can people find you? 
on LinkedIn. You also take a look at personalabm.com. Take a look at stopthesalesdrop.com. Oh, you also uh, take a look at stopthesales.com slash LinkedIn training. Yeah. That's where we did our recent training and we talked a lot about taking a more personal account-based approach on social. Perfect. This is where we all need to start now. Uh, Indeed. This is where we don't have the face-to-face. -face. We need to hit digital. This is where your relationships are. But yeah, we're not having that. As we mentioned, LinkedIn is saying 44% of organizations are seeing a significant drop in responsiveness. Yeah. We need cool. to take a more personal approach and that's going to help, I think. I will put the links to all of those somewhere in the ether for the people to um, to connect to. But uh, both of you, that has been awesome. Thank you so much for your, uh, your time today. I really do appreciate it. Uh, for everybody that's uh, tuned in, thank you. Um, please connect with both Christina and uh, Eric if it's from this. Mention this podcast or this uh, this blog. Definitely check out the training that I was very fortunate to be part of as well and did a masterclass around intent data. You can check uh, that out. Um, but uh, from uh, me, thank you, Christina. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. And I will end with this. It's been my first three-way and it's been fun. <laughs> Everybody, stay safe wherever, are you, wherever, wherever you are in the world and enjoy the rest of your day. But uh, that's all from uh, us. Thanks, everybody.